but I absolutely need Jesus every hour of every day. I can't go without him. Uh, I, as always, I, I, I'd like to start out just by you know saying uh, thank God for Jesus. Amen. What an awesome blessing it is to be able to assemble ourselves together here this evening in the name of our most holy Savior, Christ Jesus. I want to take just a brief moment to thank Pastor Mark for allowing me the privilege to, to stand behind his pulpit and to preach God's holy word tonight. I, I always get excited when I get to preach, and um, most people... I, you know, Pastor Mark intentionally um, waited till the last minute to let you know so that y'all couldn't run out the door screaming or accidentally not make it in. Um, but um, especially when we consider what is going on right now, um, within the very next few weeks, we will be celebrating what is um, the greatest holiday uh, on earth. You know, some people have their favorite holidays, and, uh, and I'm okay with that. But um, this year, Resurrection Sunday will fall right smack dab in the middle of God's holy feast of unleavened bread, which, for those of you who don't know, is, is the seven days immediately following God's holy feast of um, Passover. Now, this is something of a rarity. I don't know who they are, but they generally try to separate the two. They don't want... Uh, the Jews and the Christians celebrating at the same time. Um, so usually you don't see them at the same time, but it actually falls right smack dab in the middle of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So this is um, pretty an, a neat time to be doing it. But uh, this evening, I just want to take a brief look at the glorious resurrection of Christ Jesus, our Savior. I'm not going to be talking too much about, you know, Passover, any of that stuff tonight. I'm not going to, you know, um, leading up to uh, what many people call Easter, as we call Resurrection Sunday. Of course, uh, there's a lot of Protestant and uh, Catholic traditions. Most of them come from the Catholic Church, such as, you know, the uh, um, Mardi Gras, which is a chance to get as much sin in as possible before you fast um, for 40 days. Of course, the fasting only requires that you give up some little thing um, for those 40 days. And for most people, it's something that they don't like anyway. You know, um, you know, I always volunteer to, you know, give up work for, you know, 40 days, but uh, my wife won't let me. She always kicks me out of the house anyway. Um, and then you got, you know, you, you got all these little things that they do, and they even have, you know, the, the Ash Wednesday. They have so-called Good Friday and, and all of this. And even though you won't necessarily find that in God's holy word, I'm not going to preach about that tonight. I just want to talk a little bit about the resurrection. Now, as I prepared this Bible study lesson for this evening, I had all intentions of keeping it as short as possible. Um, after all, I worked last night and again today, so I've in the last 36 hours or so, I've probably maxed out at four hours maybe. Um, so it hasn't been that much, and that's all right. I, I'm doing great because um, I got my wife's world-famous internationally acclaimed home brew, and it'll keep me going. Um, but I also, of, of course, as I am well known to do, I plan to teach as quietly and calmly as is possible as well. Everyone knows it. Most of the time you will probably can't even hear me because I'm so quiet. Um, but if you will, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. When you find that, hold it, and then open up to John chapter 11, verse 25. And that's where we're going to start is in John 11, 25, and then we're going to jump over to Peter 1, 3. Now, while you are searching through your Bible for tonight's verses, allow me to share with you a, a quite brief and, and relevant story. It's not necessarily a funny story, um, but, but when I was younger, I remember going into a toy store, um, and I saw this toy airplane that I really liked uh, a lot. So, I stared down that old salesman behind the counter who had been, well, staring at me since the moment I walked into his store. Of course, I grew up on the wrong side of the tracks and was not known for being independently wealthy, um, which was painfully obvious by my dirty old hand-me-down clothes. So I was used to people looking at me kind of like a criminal, no big deal. But finally, I dug in one of my pockets of my faded and torn jeans, and I pulled out my payment because I was going to buy me 
that little toy airplane. You see, I was dead set on getting that toy airplane. I could already imagine how much fun that it would be pretending to be flying that thing around, you know, a rat-a-tat-tat as the guns are shooting at other airplanes or shooting at people on the ground or whatever. I, I was I was already envisioning how much fun I was going to have with my new toy airplane. So I, I dug in as deep as I could into my jean pocket, and finally I wrestled out of its denim prison one jiggly wiggly frog, which I, I proudly placed on the store's countertop in front of that grumpy old salesman, and I asked, is this enough to buy that toy airplane, sir? That old salesman scowled at me as he harshly declared, young man, we do not accept frogs as payment here. If you wish to purchase that toy, you will need $9.99. You need that amount to walk out of here with that airplane. <coughs> Not deterred, I quickly dug my hand into a jacket pocket, and I produced an old well-worn baseball mitt. I showed it to him, and I said, well, this glove is pretty nice. Uh, is it worth, you know, probably far more than $9.99? Of course, I had no idea what that meant anyway, but um, will you accept the glove for that price? The grimacing old salesman just looked down his nose at me while he shook his head back and forth. No, ain't going to happen. So I asked, how's about the, the, the glove, the frog, and, and out of another pocket, I produced one more item and banged it on the countertop. This baseball card, it's got to be worth something. Young man, the old salesman growled at me, I appreciate your effort. But the only payment acceptable is $9.99 in U.S. dollars. That is the only payment we will recognize here. As I stomped away in defeat, I mumbled, it just ain't fair. Why won't he accept my payment? The grumpy old grouch of a salesman replied, that is the terms of the offer. We cannot change the terms of the offer. We either accept it or reject it. Now that lesson still resonates with me today, and you will understand why in just a few moments. But now, by now, you should have found your place in God's holy word. So please stand with me out of great respect for the reading of God's holy word. Again, we're starting in John chapter 11, verse 25. Now this is the words of Christ Jesus. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Now, flipping over to 1 Peter chapter 1, and verse 3, God's holy word declares, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, again, I do thank you for the opportunity to, to preach your word tonight, Lord, and, and I, I just thank you for the message you have given me to share tonight, and I pray, Lord, that you use me to edify your people here tonight, Lord, whether they're gathered with us or watching online or listening later, Lord, use these words, your words, Lord, to bless them and let it be a blessing to you. For your glory, we pray in Christ Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Unfortunately, way too many people today think kind of like um, I did regarding that little toy airplane. When it comes to salvation, and is what I'm referring to, though, God says the only payment acceptable for anyone's sin is the blood of his only son, Christ Jesus. But many people still try to pay their own way to heaven with their own currency, if you will. Many people falsely believe that they can try to pay for entrance into heaven with their good works, not understanding just how worthless their good works really are in comparison to Christ Jesus' good work on the cruel cross of Calvary on Golgotha's bloody hillside. Nothing you do will ever compare to that, yet we want to work our way. Surely they think if my good deeds outweigh the bad things I have done, God will like what I have done and let me in. But our worthless good deeds will absolutely never outweigh our sinful sins, period. 
Other folks believe that performing certain religious rites and rituals will pay their way into heaven. Kind of like a contestant on that show, The Amazing Race. I don't know if it's still on, but I remember watching it years ago. And, and it's really fun. These couples or whatever, they go around the world trying to uh, solve clues and, and win um, little contest-like things until they get to the end and somebody wins something. I don't know what they win, but uh, it, that's how certain um, people that call themselves Christians like to act. They think, well, if I do these, you know, the seven holy sacraments, as one church likes to call it, if you want to call them a church, um, cult uh, or uh, false religion, whatever you want to call them, they have their seven sa- uh, holy sacraments. That you want to get to heaven, you got to go through all of them. And the last one, by the way, if I remember correctly, and some people know better than me could remember better, but uh, the last one, I believe, is marriage. And not everybody gets married. And sometimes they don't get married till much later in life. Um, my wife, she got lucky. She married you know, the, the, the best man she could possibly find as soon as she found him. Um, but I had to wait. Uh, uh, well, I'm only 39 now, so I, I had to wait till I was 30-something before uh, I met her. Uh, I was too busy traveling around. So you know, according to that, had I died um, before meeting her, I wouldn't even get into heaven because I didn't finish all seven holy sacraments. There ain't no such thing in God's holy word, but, you know, they, they come up with it anyway. But you can't win your ticket to heaven. Christ Jesus never asked anyone to complete any so-called spiritual rites or rituals. If you don't believe me, ask the thief on the cross. What did Christ Jesus ask of him? Well, pretty much nothing except belief. Even other people believe that church membership somehow equates to heaven membership, like buying into Sam's Club or Costco. But Christ Jesus never mentions the nominal demons at all. He never says you have to be a member of any church for anything. If you don't believe me, ask the woman at the well. She didn't fit into his denomination. Huh. But people still believe that. That, it, you know, I, I joined a church. I'm going to heaven. It ain't the same thing. You can join all the churches in the world, and it still ain't going to guarantee you a, a ticket to heaven. Rather, in John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You see, our charitable donations, helping others, uh, religious acts, uh, sacrificial efforts, and, and good works may be good in our own eyes, but they will never earn anyone any ticket to heaven. Those deeds are the, the frogs and the baseball mitts and baseball cards uh, that God will not accept as payment into heaven. The only way anyone will ever get into heaven is by God's way freely receiving the price that Christ Jesus already paid with his sacred blood for our wicked iniquities. God's holy word declares in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, that for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Friends, the most exciting day in the Christian calendar is quickly approaching. When we get to celebrate this, while many Christians love the, 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 the pagan celebration of Giftmas, there is, in my most humble opinion, no greater event in the history of the universe than the glorious resurrection of my Savior, Christ Jesus. You know, with Christmas being all good and everybody, it's pretty and people get gifts. Of course, you have to buy a lot of gifts and you usually spend more than you get. Um, but uh, especially as a parent, um, so I don't know where the joy is in that, but um, uh, the kids are always happy, I guess. But uh, that, that's nothing compared to Resurrection Sunday. Granted, we couldn't have the resurrection without the birth, but nothing is more important for a Christian than the resurrection of Christ Jesus. God incarnate laid aside his throne in heaven to come down to earth in the form of a mere mortal man. He lived a sinless life and he died a sinner's death. And three days later, he rose again, conquering death and hell forever. 
this one simple act purchased for all people for all time eternal life everlasting in heaven with the holy trinity of god the father god the son and god the holy spirit all together right up there in heaven what an amazing blessing that is and nothing and i mean absolutely nothing is more deserving of celebration than that unspeakable gift of love and grace and mercy for there truly is no greater love than that so this evening i want to very briefly talk about the truth of the resurrection what is you know this day that some many people call easter well let's learn a little i'm not going to go a whole lot into easter today um I, I, that's not i don't celebrate easter um, but so i'm not going to talk a whole lot about it but for many people they will celebrate what they call easter it's a roman pagan holiday honoring the false goddess of fertility and if you ever wondered what bunny rabbits and chicken eggs have to do with the resurrection of christ jesus well the simple truth is absolutely nothing it's pagan it has nothing to do with jesus but it's cute and, and fun. Rather, both bunny rabbits and eggs are pagan symbols of fertility, which is why it's associated with the, you know, the, the pagan celebration of fertility. As is common in Christianity, pagan traditions are sometimes more important than Bible truths. The Catholic missionaries that were known to simply incorporate the local pagan traditions into Catholicism when proselytizing around the world. And then later, when the Protestant churches, even Bible believing Baptists, they're still incorporating those pagan traditions into their churches today because it's what the world expects. It's tradition. Doesn't matter what God's truth is, but it's tradition. Tradition is important. So we, we honor these pagan traditions. Um, but is that what we should be honoring? Is that what God expects? Sure, the world expects pagan traditions, but is that what God expects us to do, honor world uh, pagan uh, traditions? I, I don't know what you think, but I'm guessing that God, who has said very clearly not to honor pagan idols and all that, probably doesn't want us doing so. But... It's so pretty and fun. Well, so is a lot of other sin. But we preach against that as well. So what then should we celebrate if we don't want to celebrate pagan idols? And Well, that's fine. Um, just as we falsely proclaim around Giftmas, the same rule applies to the resurrection of Christ Jesus. People say this all the time. They just don't live it. But they say Christ Jesus is the reason for the season. It's the same concept. It's the same truth, even though people don't believe it. It's the same truth for, for Resurrection Sunday. The only reason we're celebrating Resurrection Sunday is because of Christ Jesus, the one who died, was buried, and rose again, the resurrection. That's what we're celebrating. So it's okay to say Jesus is the reason for the season, even at the time of the resurrection, because absolutely in fact everything we do according to god's holy word should be focused on you know christ jesus so rather than other things the resurrection is about christ jesus the cross of calvary and the risen lord three basic concepts we're going to go over so let us therefore examine those three just a little bit closer for the world most of them do not even know who christ jesus is sure many have heard of him they, they may even use his name all the time in vain, but few actually know who he is. And that's on us, by the way. We are the ones who are supposed to be living it and telling people. You can tell them, if you, but if you ain't living it, you're just you know, speaking um, empty words. Uh, we need to be living it as well. But Christ Jesus is God in the flesh. And many people even... And, and Baptist churches don't seem to understand how important that is. He, he, he was not just a, a good man. He was not even just a, a great, uh, a great uh, uh, prophet. He is God, the creator of all things. That's amazing that he would love us enough to come live with us for a little while just so he could die for us 
so that he can live with us for all eternity. That's amazing. Now, as we are all aware of, we can see just how evil humans are every day. Um, just a few days ago, a girl pretending to be a boy murdered three little children and three other adults at a Christian school. Why? Because the human heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. You know, I don't care what that, that uh, so-called Dr. Phil tells you. We are not all good. We ain't good at all, really, when you think about it. But Christ Jesus taught us in Mark chapter 7, verse 21 through 23, that for from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these things are evil things come from within and defile the man. And people like Phil want to say how good we are? He's got it wrong, folks. We are not good. For us blood-washed, born-again Christians, our good comes from Christ Jesus within us. So yes, humans are inherently bad, no matter what, like I said, Dr. Phil tries to say otherwise. But the Lord your God is holy. And we cannot enter into the presence of an holy God while still clothed in our sinful sins. And we know the verses, but in Romans chapter 3 and 23 teaches us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23 teaches us that the wages of that sin is death. Now, for us educated folks, we know what that means. It's not referring to necessarily the physical death. It's referring to the second death, separation away from God eternally that's the worst type of punishment you can get if god is the greatest thing since everything which he is then being separated away from him should be the worst thing ever no greater love what an amazing concept out of that no greater love, God made a way for us to be reconciled to him. And that way is the one and only begotten Son of God, Christ Jesus. As I mentioned earlier, Christ Jesus knowingly and willingly gave up his throne in heaven to become human flesh, God incarnate. Christ Jesus was born of a virgin and lived a perfect sinless life, both of which are miracles of impossibility. We all like to think that we're good. Some will even proclaim it so all the time. But we know that we're not good. It is humanly impossible to live a perfect, sinless life. Humanly impossible. Christ Jesus is the living God, creator of all things, seen and unseen. As I mentioned, he's not just a good teacher or even a great prophet. Christ Jesus is God. And this God came down from glory to live with us. 33 short years. Certainly, you know, anyone dying at the age of 33 in America, we always talk about he died way too young or she still had so much life to live. 33 years is all he spent down with here, uh, with us down here. Then one fateful day, Christ Jesus allowed himself to become the ultimate sacrifice of love and grace and mercy and voluntarily walked to his torturous murder on that cruel cross of Calvary. He could have at any time said, oh, 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 no, I ain't doing this. Yet he voluntarily walked that road that day. He allowed them to beat him and drive the nails into his hands and feet. He didn't fight back. He didn't even call on his legions upon legions of angels to come down and, and do his dirty work for him. No. He voluntarily accepted that for us. John 3.16 teaches us that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life and Romans 6 23 further explains that the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord 
allow me to remind you that the gift of salvation may be free for us, but our freedom is not free. Salvation costs God and Christ Jesus more dearly than any of us will ever fully understand. Even if all of us combined all of our loss together, it will never even come close to the loss that our salvation costs. It costs the life of God. Nothing you can ever, you could put all the gold of the world together and all the diamonds and all the platinum, and you still cannot pay that debt. That's an incredible, incredible purchase right there. Certainly not a fair trade. Our sin for his life, that's not fair. Not even close. On what was surely the most saddest day in the history of heaven, God and the angels stood at attention saluting their great captain as they watched sinful sinners cruelly beat and torture him, ripping the flesh from his bones with their cat and nine tails, pounding a crown of thorns into his sacred brow, and even nailing his bloody naked body on a cross so that even the simple act of breathing was unbearably painful. And as if that was not enough, they mocked him as well, not knowing that he was doing that for them. Finally, I can imagine that the, the many, many tears were shed in heaven as the angels probably begged God to allow them to strike down all those wicked, evil sinners involved in this most heinous murder. Friends, we do not celebrate this death. This is the worst event in all history, before and after human history. This is the most horrible event that ever happened. We do not celebrate his death. Besides the fact that it did not happen on a Friday, it is hard to experience anything good out of the murder of God. So-called Good Friday is a figment of Catholic imagination. The Catholic Church can't even count to three to figure out the difference between how many th uh, three days and nights. They can't even figure out which day it happened on. Don't trust anything they say if they can't even count to three. I mean, three fingers. I mean, come on. How difficult is that? Connor can count to three. He can count much higher than that, we know. And yet, the Catholic leadership, they can't even make it to three correctly. Don't trust any of their sinful ways. But, oh, what a horribly sad day that must have been. But I can also imagine that all of heaven must have surely erupted in the most jubilant shout for joy as Christ Jesus finally shouted out in eternal victory, It is finished! It's not a whimpering cry as I've said before. This is the best shout of victory you're ever going to hear. Christ Jesus screams out, It is finished! Imagine Satan's smile, thinking that he had won a fatal blow to the Godhead. Surely Satan thought that Christ Jesus' final shout was one of defeat. And I guess in one sense, it was a shout of defeat for Satan, but not for Christ or Christians. Christ Jesus died to pay the debt of our sins. But how dark the world must have felt as they lay his lifeless body in the tomb Everyone thought that all hope was now lost forever. Their prophesied Messiah was defeated in death. I am willing to bet that Satan was throwing quite a party together with Dr. Death and Mr. Decay as they, they put that body into the tomb. But wait. As death and decay paced back and forth as they watched over the lifeless body of Christ Jesus behind that stone in that sealed tomb, as they tried desperately to destroy all remnants of Christ, what shock they must have experienced as all of their worms or bacteria or whatever could not touch that sacred body. Not, nothing, not, no, his body showed no signs of life. It would not decay in death. No rigor mortis set in. No stench. Not even one festering wound. The body wouldn't die. Sure, there was no breath. There was no heartbeat. But there was no death in that body. 
Dr. Death and Mr. Decay, they worked so hard to try to get that body to deteriorate because they want to show that, see, we've won. Hmm. I wonder how they must have felt after three days later. See, as death and decay paced back and forth, they, 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 they must have been stressed. Not that I care about their stress at all. Not my problem. But finally, after those three dark days of despair, the impossible happened. Remember the words of Christ Jesus. With men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Even a three-day-old body being resurrected back to life. Don't believe me? Just ask Lazarus. I can imagine that the angel choir in heaven was now singing, Up from the grave he arose with the mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. And maybe even, and some of you won't even know this one, he is risen, hallelujah, he is risen, Christ our Lord. They're singing, shouting in glory. Surely they sang at the top of their lungs as that stone was rolled away that glorious Sunday morning. And Christ Jesus conquered death and hell, rising again from the dead to save us all from our sins. Friends, this is what we celebrate. Without the resurrection of Christ Jesus, the crucifixion of Christ Jesus was simply a very, very sad ending with no power or glory. But through the limitless power of God, Christ Jesus rose again, full of life and love. But not just for himself. Christ Jesus rose again to give us eternal life with him through his love. Folks, all y'all already know how excited I get when I talk about Christ Jesus or, or heaven or especially my incredibly awesome wife. But if you do not get equally excited, then I have to wonder, what are you celebrating? Because there's nothing better to celebrate than our salvation because of his resurrection. Resurrection Sunday is the most celebration-worthy event in the history of the universe. Not just because Christ Jesus arose, but even better, why Christ Jesus arose to pay our sin debts and buy our pardon. Friends, I can take you to see more cemeteries than you care to see. And all you will see are millions of markers for millions of people who have left this life under death. But not one single one of those dead bodies can claim to have risen again from death unto life for you. As Resurrection Sunday very quickly approaches, I preach this tonight hoping that you will take time to read the Bible story of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ Jesus. I, I, I hope that you will think about how much Christ Jesus paid for your salvation and ask yourself what you are doing to thank him for that incredible sacrifice. There's many things that we can do. We have ministries. We have our own life to live. Are you celebrating that resurrection Every day, we should. We don't have to wait till one day out of the year to celebrate the resurrection of our Savior and our salvation. We can celebrate every day, in and out, season after season, month after month. We should never stop celebrating the greatest event in the history of the universe. So I ask you, what are you celebrating? As for me and my house, we will celebrate our salvation, won by the sacrifice of Christ Jesus on that bloody tree. It's a, a very humbling thing to celebrate. I know that I am not worthy of Christ Jesus' love and sacrifice. But I also know that Christ Jesus is wholly worthy of my adoration, dedication, and celebration. 
Nothing else on this planet needs to be honored more than Christ Jesus in our own life. And friends, there simply ain't no other form of payment accepted. But Christ Jesus alone, you can give him your frogs. You can give him your your, uh, old, uh, worn-out baseball mitts, and you could even give him some baseball cards if you think that'll help. It's all just filthy rags, just like all our good deeds. It's not going to get you into heaven. The only, the only way to heaven is through Christ Jesus. And as we approach the sacred day coming up, I I, I beg you to to consider. We have a, a day that we set aside once a year, the Tuesday before Resurrection Sunday. We get together and we celebrate the Lord's table. And when Pastor Mark is, is leading that service, he will ask you if you have considered your own life. Is there a sin you're trying to hide from everybody? Maybe you need to get right with God before you come forward. Maybe it's just that you haven't been doing enough. I don't know what your life is. I can't tell you that. But he's going to ask you, can you accept this worthily? First of all, we are not worthy. But are you at least trying to live for Christ Jesus? Have you have you talked to him about your sins? Have you thanked him for his sacrifice? Because that's what we're celebrating that Tuesday is his sacrifice. It's a, a very solemn event. When I say celebrating, I'm not talking about a party. It's a very solemn event. I'm not worthy. I know I'm not. I never will be. But he is worthy. He and he alone is worthy. So I, I ask you to celebrate our risen Savior and his unspeakable gift of our salvation so rich and free. When, when that Tuesday comes up, I believe it's the 3rd uh, of uh, April, and that Tuesday comes up, I pray that you have taken the time to search out your own heart. We know our hearts are wicked and evil, but I pray that you have searched out your heart and your life and are ready to honor that sacrifice because God deserves it. Christ Jesus earned it. We don't deserve him. I pray that that the, the words today are not just empty words for you, but that you will take into serious consideration this incredible sacrifice. And, of course, come Resurrection Sunday, shout for joy. Shout at the top of your lungs because he is risen indeed. Let us pray. Dear